through the 20th. The Powell Committee recognizes Isabella Aguirre White Dress, Oglala Sulacota, who represents this powwow as the reigning princess. Thank you to the Whitmore Charitable Trust for providing financial support for this project. Also, the Nebraska Arts Council, a state agency, has supported the Fort Omaha Intertribal Powwow through its matching grants program funded by the Nebraska Legislature, the Endowment, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Visit www.nebraskaartscouncil.org for information on how the Nebraska Arts Council can assist your organization or how you can support the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off, but you may always contact the hosts. Send your questions at any time to moderator Barbara Velasquez through the chat. Also watch the chat for a link to an online evaluation. Today, Powell Committee member Alex Leverin has a message about a possible reward for completing this online evaluation. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Lover and I'm with Metropolitan Community College. I am here to invite you to complete the evaluation. Uh, once you complete it, your name will be entered into a drawing to win this beautiful star quilt made by a local artist named Carrie Reed. The drawing will take place September 23rd. Good luck. Thank you, Alex. And now I'll be introducing our moderator for today's panel. Carolyn Fiscus, Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska, is the proud mom of Kai and Tierra and grandma of Caden and Kailuni. Her second profession has been as a teacher for 48 years, most recently retired from the University of Nebraska Omaha in Native American Studies. Specifically, her teaching areas are Indigenous Studies, Teacher Preparation, and Life. She has dedicated her life to the process of decolonizing her Indigenous environment through teaching, coaching, and practice. She, her partner Carol, one dog, 13 barn cats, and family make their home on the family farm in the old settlement of Maple Landing, Iowa. She is a grandma emeritus of the Maple Landing ceremonial grounds. Please <laughs> welcome Carolyn, who will be moderating today's panel. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. That was nice. Um, as she said, my name's Carolyn Fiscus. My students for 20 years have called me Big Mama. I don't know why, but I've kind of grown into the name. So um, I'd like to introduce our other panelists. I think I'm supposed to do this, right? Jennifer Connors. Um, where are you at, Jennifer? Oh, there she is. She's clapping. I'm right head. here. Hello. There she is. Uh, the Bad River and... Sokoagon bands of Lake Superior Chippewa. The Coggin band. Around up in that area this last summer. Beautiful. I was along uh, trying to get some medicine rocks from the beach. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know those little black ones? Yep. The we little round up, ones. Yep. We gathered a few of them. We went to Black Beach and a couple other places. So, and then uh, my Chunchke over here, Mike Scheibelhofer, is from Omaha. He's going to talk about the Omaha bustle, and Jennifer's going to talk about floral patterns. And then my chunchke over here, Steve Tamayo, he's Shi Changu Lakota, and he's going to talk about three different dress styles. And um, I'm not going to talk about anything except for keep the peace. So <laughs> if you want to ask me a question, you can ask me a question, but I don't know much. I'll tell you what I know, but. What I do know you can take to the bank. I always tell my students that. Um, so we'd like each of you to introduce yourself, your tribal affiliation, and give us an idea of the type of traditional dress or artifacts that you create as an artist. So who wants to go first? Steve, you go first. All right. <clears throat> So once again, my name is Steve Tamayo. I am the cultural specialist for Omaha Public Schools. And the art form in which I try to uh, replicate is uh, the traditional art form of the plains. And so I try to maintain uh, the old style techniques of construction of 
our hides of our real sinew, utilizing our porcupine quills, incorporating our natural paint pigments uh, along with our hide glue. Um, I'm also a brain tanner in which I, I butcher out my own elk, deer, buffalo, in which I create brain tan and make our humpas, hembe, you name it, uh, however you want to identify our moccasins. And so I have uh, five amazing young daughters who are still in that dancing circle. And so we are starting this year's uh, new projects all out of uh, a smoked uh, brain tan elk hide that I oh, wow. acquired. So we're making all new moccasins and leggings. So kind of dreadfully looking forward to that <laughs> experience all fall time because I got to make uh, five sets and then start in with the grandkids again. So oh, thank you. I am so sorry. My bad, my bad. I shut it off, I did. Our next artist is Mike Scheibelhofer, and he's uh, known all over this area for his dancing, but he's also an artist. He made, if you look at all these beautiful regalia surrounding us, these are Mike's um, creations. Take it away, Junchke. Hello, I'm Mike Scheibelhofer. Um, I do pretty much modern dance regalia. I make everything from men's fancy dance, traditional dance. Um, I also have kids that dance, so I've made uh, women's fancy, uh, women's traditional outfits. Uh, I do a lot of the work for the other dancers in this area, making head roaches, um, and both ki all kinds of bustles, fancy dance, traditional. Um, moccasins, any kind of beadwork I can do. Um, I got got uh, suckered into making the crown for this year's powwow at the last minute. Um, so, like I said, I can anything. I can beat anything. <laughs> um, uh, like they said, I, I still fancy dance and I traditional dance. Um, pretty much, I'm known all over the Midwest from. Uh, North Dakota to Oklahoma and east to Memphis, they know me. So I'm a part of the Omaha tribe in Nebraska. Um, come out of the Wolf and the uh, Lovejoy families. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, <laughs> how did you, both of you, how did you learn to do your skills? What happened? Well, I believe it or not, I started in Boy Scouts. I believe and, it. And uh, started beating. And then through books and friends, I learned how to do pretty much the rest. Uh, I actually learned how to do hackle bustles from Johnny Whitecloud, who mm. was a famous world champion fancy dancer back in the 70s. He uh, gave me a lot of advice along with uh, Tommy Snowball, <clears throat> learned how to make bustles. Uh, Howard Wolf showed me basically how to make traditional bustles and uh, told me the meanings of what goes into an Omaha bustle. Um, everything else is kind of trial by error. I decide I want to make something and I do some research and go at it. <laughs> yeah, just do it, huh? How about you, my friend? So long ago, you know, I came across this little grandpa in the Omaha area by the name of Howard Wolf. And so um, mm -hmm. he as well explained uh, the Omaha bustle and the meaning of it. And then through research, I figured out what is the difference between Omaha bustles uh, compared to Lakota. Uh, we call it Okichila Miyuganaka. And so it kind of looks like a cactus. And so um, after my beginnings and my teachings here in Omaha, I took off to the Rosebud Reservation where I found a lot of grandmas and grandpas up there that uh, took the time to explain everything, but incorporate the language first and foremost, you know, 
Um, I think that's the most important thing about this is, you know, understanding, you know, Lakwatiya Wuaglak. And so understanding our own languages that exist still today and then incorporating them into this art, this traditional art form. And so today, you know, we utilize a lot of the new age materials, just like our like our bustles in the back, you know, uh, because of the dyed feathers, you know, but they're all rooster feathers. So that's what's cool about it. And so understanding that the contemporary dyes that we incorporate because today it's about, you know, flashier uh, styles and colors and all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, I've been to powwows where they've actually had lights incorporated into their bustles and they hit these buttons and their bustles are lighting up. I was oh, like, wow, you're kidding. I was like, that's kind of carried away. But anyway, you know, I try to maintain uh, to this old traditional style. And so, which, which uh, incorporates a lot of our stories. And so that's, I think the most important thing. And so, you know, having my brother, Mike over here, you know, learning from the same teachers, it was the same information, same source. And so, but what we did with that is we expanded. And so understanding that, you know, we got help from the outside. And so, um, but we're both in the Omaha community now. So, you know, whoever wants to, to be a part of this, just contact us because, you know, we're more than willing to share this way of life with anybody who wants to sit down and learn, but it's about a commitment. It's about perseverance. So thank you. Jennifer, how about you? Could you tell Hi, us? What do you do? Yes, hello. I'd like to greet everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jennifer Connors. I reside in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am of the Bad River and Sakagan Mole Lake Band of Chippewa Indians. Um, I am 45 years old. I have three children of my own. My youngest daughter, Sophia Najinekwe, she has just turned 18 this past summer, and she is my only dancer. <laughs> Um, she has been dancing since she was, she could walk basically. Her first Paul was when she was four years old. So a lot of the beadwork that I'm going to show you this evening is going to be hers. Uh, I was asked to speak upon our, um, the reasons why we have our floral work here. Our floral work, as you can tell amongst a lot of the different tribes, when you look at their beadwork, and you look at um, their regalia and how they're put together, you can tell which region of the United States or Canada mm -hmm. that they reside in. And a lot of the um, reasons why we use our floral work in our beadwork is because that's where our land is. You know, that's where our flowers grow. That's where our rice grows on the water. They um, just had ricing season now, and that's where our migration stories come from, where we came from out east of Sojibwe and Anishinaabe people. We came from out east and we, walked and we went through those great lakes and we were told in our stories that we need to find the the lands where the food grows on water and that's where that wild rice comes from it's one of our um traditional foods another one is um our strawberries our strawberries are really prominent especially within our women and they are the heartberry is what we call them you know we're connected to mother earth in that way but um, I, like I said, I've been, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that old, but I, I'm getting there. You know, my eyesight's <laughs> kind of going. I need bifocals now. So it's kind of difficult for me to beat and watch TV at the same time. But mm -hmm. I still do it because that's my therapy. That's my healing. You know, when I'm feeling sad or feeling down or stressed or something, I always, you know, go to my beat or go to my soul. And when I go to Paul's, I take everything with me. I got my backpack on. I got my my beads ready, everything. I said, uh, a lot of my friends know me. You know, they'll see me at a powwow and they're like, I don't think I've ever seen you not beading. You know, you're always doing something, Jennifer. You're always, you know, you moving your hands, you know, and in that way. But um, I'm more of a contemporary artist as far as my beadwork goes. Um, our woodlands, they go back, you know, many, many, many generations, many, many hundreds of years. But um, the colors that I use, I've been beading since I was probably about eight years old. So over 30 years, I've been beading. I was taught by an aunt of mine. But um, as other people have mentioned, um, you know, you learn the tricks of the trade. You know, a lot of people like to take credit for the, the work that I produce. Like, oh, I taught her that. I taught her that. 
and I kind of just let them, you know, take that credit, be proud of that, you know, because I'm proud of my work, but a lot of it is trial and error. You know, a lot of the materials that I use nowadays is um, more contemporary. I don't use a lot of hides. Uh, when I beat on, I beat on pollen, which is more of like a felt type fabric. Um, I use cotton fabric. I use satin ribbons. I use check beads, you know, Nemo thread, my needles. Um, some of the things that if they're requested, I use hide if I need to back them. Um, I use that. Otherwise, I order what is vinyl. And some of it is to be um, more cost effective. Nowadays, you know, we, we kind of struggle, especially with the pandemic, you know, people are losing their jobs, but I don't like to charge a lot for my beadwork. I like to charge what is fair enough for me as far as whatever my supplies and my time will cost. And then I negotiate or I make trade with um, others as well. But like I said, if it's requested, then I will go back to the traditional ways and using those hides and gathering those, um, those, those old style beads that, that are needed to, to make something. Uh, there's a few things, I don't know if I'm on my iPhone because my computer is not, the speaker doesn't work. So I'm hoping you guys can hear me well and kind of see behind me. Um, like I said, I do a lot of sewing. I do a lot of um, uh, uh, bead work, but the bags, like some of the bags that I make ha have my floral work in there. And they also have that new contemporary style of this ribbon work. Ribbon work was around for many, many years, but it's become more popular with the younger ladies that I think brought it back a few years ago. And then it kind of went widespread with that, you know, uh, ribbon skirts aren't just for ceremonies anymore. You know, we wear them every day, wear them to school, wear them to work, wear them to, you know, clean the house, whatever it is. It's not just for ceremonies or cooking or taking care of, you know, our people and our funerals that have passed on. But I do a lot of my um, ribbon skirts. I don't know if you guys can see that, but um, it usually know. takes me a few hours to do that. Um, like I said, I've learned the tricks of the trade. I use Elmer's glue to hold my ribbons down before I sew them in. Um, but that, again, that's just, um, you know, a way of, of modernizing and uh, making it easier, you know, on, on the person who's doing it. There's times where I could be working on four or five skirts a week because I have orders to put out. Uh, other things that um, I've made, you can see Sophia's moccasins are... Oh, wow kind of beat up here but these are fully beaded they're kind of plain style but I call them like Powell style you know I, I know that there's a they are plain style but um they're fully beaded moccasins they have her beadwork on there they she also has a set that I made these are our Ojibwe style our pucker toes mm -hmm. if you can see that again they're kind of modernized with the bias tape on there but these are Parker Toe style moccasins. They have that vamp in the front and then they have this cuff yeah. on the back <clears throat> that goes all the way around. But you can mm -hmm. see I incorporated those strawberries and those berries and those vines mm -hmm. of our way, you know, of where we come from or these Great Lakes area, this Northern area. Like I said, I do reside in Milwaukee. I have, <clears throat> I have been born and raised here and I never lived on the reservation, I have visited. I have many, many, many people across this, you know, Powell country that call us family. Um, you know, many different tribes that uh, we associate with, a lot of our nannies and our cocos, and you know, we have a lot of, lot of different people that take care of us along this Powell trail that we travel on. Um, so I don't want to say I'm an urban Indian, but I am. <laughs> but I do know our way of life. And I've, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Sophia, like I said, she's been traveling this way of life, you know, since she could walk, since she was born, since she was in the womb, she was traveling these power ways, you know. So she's 18 now and she's, she's done a lot within her life. And um, like I like to share her beadwork. This is another mm -hmm. set that I've done for her. You see the different colors that we have in there all these different colors of the flowers. Some of the flowers that we have are um, your own design. There's probably no design. There shouldn't be any design that's alike. 
um, within our within our um, tribes, you know, everybody has their own their own design, their own family design, you know. Uh, I don't like to post a lot of my work on Facebook or on social media just because um, of the fact we can't copyright our, our, our beadwork. You know, we can't put a patent on our, the way that we bead. So in order to keep it to ourselves, you know, we wear it out in the circle or we wear it, you know, walking down the street or whatnot. But I don't like to post it a whole lot on on social media because um, I'm flattered if someone copies it. But then again, I kind of get offensive because it's like mm -hmm. I took the time in my design, my creativity to make that. But yet you just copied it. You know, how how fair is that? Mm -hmm. But um, here's some more of her beadwork. It kind of matches that set that she mm -hmm. has. Like mm -hmm. I said, I try to incorporate these strawberries and these blueberries into her beadwork, no matter what it is. Um, <clears throat> but I do a lot of other things too. You know, I kind of, <coughs> my, <clears throat> the main thing that I do, I do a lot of beadwork and sewing. That's the main thing that I make. I know that uh, last year I was approached by the Powell Committee to um, commission, I was commissioned to make their uh, crown for their princess for last year. And that has a lot of the floral work that goes with our tribe. But I also make earrings, like you can see the earrings I wear here, the earrings, I incorporate different ways of uh, techniques of beading, this kind of twisty. It's a little bit of my um, Oneida style. I have a lot of friends, relatives, um, who are Oneida, who their reservation is just short two hours from us. But I took classes in order to do that, that raised beadwork, that um, kind of Haudenosaunee type of beadwork. So I kind of incorporate everything that I've learned over the years uh, into, my, into my beadwork. But I make different styles of earrings, as you can see. Big ones, small ones, shiny ones, colorful ones. I don't like to use a whole lot of black in my beadwork, I don't wear black as much, but you know, you can see the black t-shirt that I have on only because it has this beautiful, beautiful um, uh, floral design. This, I think I bought this when we were out in Twin Buttes and it was a gentleman, an artist who, uh, I think he was Chippewa from up over that way. Um, this is his artwork that I'm wearing, but, um, these little keychains, I, I get commissioned a lot for orders, you know. These are little keychains that will be used as um, volunteer gifts or gifts to give away at our Indian community school down here. So I get commissioned a lot to make uh, things for others, you know, uh, paid for it or trade for it, whatever the case may be. Um, another thing, like I said, Sophia just turned 18 and here's her graduation cap. You know, I did her graduation cap. It's fully beaded. She's got her quill work on there. But like I said, I'm more of a contemporary style of um, artist. Um, behind me, like we incorporate our um, floral work into many, many different outfits. This outfit, grass dance outfit belongs to my partner. Um, but uh, basically that's, that's where, you know, that's where we come from. Our, our flower, our beadwork, our um, designs, they come from the land. You know, they come from the flowers that we see every day. They come from the trees, the leaves. There's a lot, like if you see traditional uh, woodland clothing, they'll have like maybe maple leaves in there. They'll have the stalks of uh, the, the rice. When it grows on the water, it comes in stalks. It just doesn't come in little rice that you get to cook it up. But, um, you know, maybe you'll see some cedar, some cedar um, leaves in there, you know, so it's like we, we incorporate those designs because that's where we come from. That's what we see every day is this, this life, this green, this floral, this, you know, everything. And I kind of was laughing this summer. We went out to uh, North Dakota a couple of times for a pow. I said, how can you guys live out here? It's just one color you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I don't know if there's any questions for me, um, yes, but I'll got be here. Some questions. So um, this is for all three of you. What is the project you have worked on for the longest amount of time? 
how long was it that you worked on it and what was the project so what took you the longest how long and what was the project so uh, yeah as for me um one of the longest projects that i worked on i made a, a men's traditional uh beadwork set so that included a fully beaded belt side drops oh, wow. moccasins cuffs necktie uh, beaded roach the spreader for the roach i mean the beaded spreader the sockets for the um the feathers what else earrings uh uh breastplate beaded breastplate that went with it um that kind of was like the leg like the wrap rope that set probably took me about a good three years to finally have it fully completed wow. um the person that commissioned me for that, um, I told him when I when he first came to me and he asked me, hey, I want this outfit done. This is what I want. You know, these, these are the pieces that I want. And I kind of laughed at him. And I was like, you know, that can't be done in, you know, a few months. That's not going to be done in a year. That might not even be done in a couple of years. So what we did is we took our time and he's, he picked out exactly what he wanted. He's like, well, I need my belt done. I need my side drops done. I need moccasins and I need cuffs. And so I kind of did them in pieces and that he grew his outfit. And that's kind of how we do now. You know, that's how I do with Sophia too, as well. Uh, your outfit is always ever changing. You're adding to it. You're making new things. So, it, you know, it did take me a long time to get that done, but it, it was something steady that I worked on and I love it. Thank you. And then um, how about you guys? What's the longest these grandkids? Like? Well, easily, once again, when I make a fully beaded beadwork set, like you see on here, that cape and apron is fully beaded. Um, and when I make a dance set, I do everything matching the headband, uh, the, the cape, apron, belt, side drops, moccasins. Um, and just the beadwork, I may spend six months uh, doing a complete set of beadwork. Um, and then once you get done with that, then you have to ha add the roach and the angoras. Uh, up in Macy this year, uh, my brother Pete Snowball was laughing at me. After all these years, we were sitting there talking and he noticed that I even had the leather around my bells beaded. Oh. And uh, so it he was really amazed. Uh, the other thing is probably the hackle bustles you see behind me. Um, I may spend three, four months making a set of hackle bustles like, like you see here. <laughs> Those are probably the two most things, but like everything takes time. If you do it right. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I'm not the kind that can sit down and bead 12 hours a day until I get it done. I, I'll work three, four, five hours a day and then get walk away from it. Maybe even work on a different project so that I stay fresh when I'm working on that project. How about you, Steve? So I'm working on, a, it's called the Creative Capital Grant. And so it's a national grant in which uh, I submitted my proposal. And so it's a four year project and so by the time I'm done, I will showcase the 13 buffalo robes of the Lakota of rites of passage of oh. our winter counts of our blanket strips. And so I decided to, instead of incorporate our beadwork, that I'm going to um, quill the blanket strip and the medallions all the way across that buffalo robe. Oh, wow. And so when I paint, um, one of my robes will be all natural earth paint pigments in which I will mix with my uh, high glue that I make. And so the high glue helps the paint pigment actually adhere to the buffalo hide. And so when I'm all done with the 13 robes, um, I'm showcasing at the Smithsonian. And then I want to showcase at the Jawson Museum. And the robes that I complete, I'm actually taking them up to a school in Standing Rock on the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota, and I'm gifting the school 
And so six years ago, you know, there was a school created at Standing Rock because we were protesting a pipeline in which they wanted to go underneath the, uh, the river, the Missouri River. And so that was the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so um, while I was there, we actually created a school and Elena Eagle Shield is the founder of that school. And they gave ownership to the kids to name the school. But up there, there's a lot of kids that, that still speak Lakota. And so they named that school in the Lakota language, they call it the Miniwichoni Nakichizi Owaiwa, which means the Defenders of the Water School. Mm. And so from that time to present, we've been fundraising to create our own uh, cultural immersion school. And so the robes that I complete, we're gonna line the hallways of our new school. And so we just completed our uh, two earth lodges about a month ago. And so that was on uh, national uh, public broadcast. And so they were showcasing the earth lodges of the Defenders of the Water School. So that's my big project, which hopefully... Um, would you say four years or four six years. years? Yeah. So I am year one into it. And so I uh, have to brain tan some of my robes. And so I've collected all 13. I've, I've cleaned them, I've scraped them. And so I'm, I'm ready to start uh, adornment and decoration and painting. So mm. that's my big project, probably the biggest in my lifetime. So thanks. I have another question here for all three of you. Um, where can the audience members purchase Jennifer's tote bags? And do you, got, do you guys have things for sale? They want to know. Uh, my tote bags, um, they are available. Like I, I have so many orders, unfortunately, that it seems like as soon as they get done with one thing, I'm on to the next. Um, when I make some earrings or I make my bags, they, I, you know, I post them just on my personal Facebook page and they're like gone like that. But I can share with Barb um, my uh, phone number information, my, my email. Um, if you guys want to place like a custom order, that's fine. Otherwise on Facebook, uh, my daughter, Sophia, we have a Facebook uh, page available, Naj's sewing creation that's n-a-a-z-h apostrophe s sewing creations um if you want to look on there you can get a hold of us through that or if you want to get a hold of me through facebook as well jennifer connors is my um tag name so uh i'm always open for orders i'm always willing to make money and share my creations with you guys that's Naja's creative. Naja's sewing creations. N A A Z H. Her name yeah. is Naja Nakwe. Uh, that's where we kind of grabbed that from. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I, I do most of my work that I sell kind of one on one, custom made for whoever would like something made uh, I don't really have any type of website or anything I usually just go one on one um, uh, <laughs> so basically you get they, to know him. <laughs> yeah basically people come up to me and uh, at powwows and ask if I would be interested in making outfit pieces for them and tell me what they want and then I go from there um that's really uh, all it's okay. funny because we were saying earlier uh since i retired i've been busier than when i was working yeah because i it's non-stop i just it seems like i go from one project right to the next people are always getting in touch with me and so but like okay. i said i don't really sell outwards yeah i think when when you have this kind of beautiful traditional kind of art creations, you know, it's not like people sell their stuff on the web or anything. You have to, it's a personal thing. You know, you have to get to know the artist and then develop that relationship so that, you know, you can kind of know what it is you need or want and work with the artist to 
get um, get the creation done. Beautiful stuff. I you have a buffalo robe down at the national park office. I do. It's beautiful. So, you know, nowadays I'm more into research. I'm more into uh, trying to find a lot of the old um, lost techniques and trying to bring them back. And, you know, I, I'm focusing more on my quill work and the more traditional uh, art forms of our natural paint pigments, our vegetable dyes, and, you know, what was the mordant used long ago to adhere to soak up those dyes and those paint pigments. And so that's what, you know, where I'm at right now. But like Mike said, you know, I do a lot of uh, very personal items because my passion lies with uh, feather work. And what type of bustle is it? Is it a Umaha bustle? Is it, you know, uh, a Cree blood, you know, true chicken dance bustle? And so, you know, when I go to powwows today, you know, I see a lot of chicken dancers out there and, and unfortunately they, they're wearing a lot of birds of prey. And so that prairie chicken is, is a fowl. It's, it's, it's not a, a meat eater. And so the way that he dances and the way that that style of dance originates, you know, they're mimicking that, that dance style specific. Um, and so I try to stay true to that. And I'm not bashing any of our chicken dancers out there, trust me. It's just that I try to stay true because the old chicken dance bustles shouldn't have birds of prey feathers in them. And so, um, but that's what I wanna bring back. I wanna bring back that, that loss, that, that absent narrative of our you know, articles, our pieces of adornment. And so what society did that come from? What region did it come from? And so is it a true, you know, umaha, you know, hage, with that wolf tail and with that stuffed crow on there. I mean, that makes it very specific to the Umaha people only. And so for us as Lakotas, mm -hmm. you know, we uh, adopted, you know, these items because they were brought to us by the Umaha people years ago. And so from that, you know, we created our own style from that specific society. And so understanding the parts of, you know, our Helushka and our Hetushka, you know, mm -hmm. how it evolved into the Herushka for the Pawnees. And it just kept evolving and expanding and spreading out. And so you can go all over the world now and see Powell's because it originated here in Ni Badaska. And that's the importance of that, of that warrior society of the Umaha people. And so that's the story that we're trying to um, maintain and hold on to and share with that next generation. And so when I make bustles, you know, they are correct to that specific style, to that specific warrior society, or to that specific dance society. And so last week, you know, just like Mike, you know, we get we get notices, you know, the drop of a hat, you know, can you knock this out? And so um, <laughs> I was asked to make a belt for Miss North Dakota for next week so she can walk that runway. And so I was just like, I'll do it just for an olive our uh, garden. What do they call that? What's that place? Olive Garden. Olive Garden. I was like, gift certificate. Give me a gift certificate. I was like, I just want to see my belt on stage. I was like, I think that's freaking wicked, man. You know. <laughs> and so, but things like that, you know, um, I'll, I'll try to squeeze in. But man, my schedule is crazy. And so, but you it's know. it's more focused on research, serious. And so. What is the name? How do we utilize that language specific? Because that is what we need to maintain is our language once again, you know, yeah. because that gives it a deeper sense of what is it, you know, and where did it come from? And so understanding the true history of that bustle and how it came from Oklahoma, you know, and what tribe started that. And so that's what my research, that's what my story is all based on. It's just like the jingle dress up, up north, you know, and so understanding where it came from, because I took one of my daughters a long time ago up to uh, northern Minnesota so that she understood the true origins of that dance mm -hmm. and how it came to be. And we had her inducted into that society. And so that meant more to her than, than you know anything. So with that, it's all about research. It's maintaining our 
true identity linguistically and keeping it true to the societies of our warriors and our dance societies. So thanks. And the stories too. Um, Howard used to tell me the story about that Maha Bustle, mm -hmm. about the battle that went on and all of that. And I think those things are really important too. Like Steve says, to know that background and uh, the stories that go with it are very important. The stories of warriors and superheroes and tricksters and whoever, you know. Um, they want to show your dress stuff now. You ready? Right on. Nate, we're going to show them. Okay. We're going to put on Steve's um, presentation on the side fold dress, the two hide dress, and the three hide dress. When I saw this, I thought these are dresses you hide under. <laughs> two hide and three hide. Then I thought, oh no, it must be like a deer hide or something, you know? Correct. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to roll those now. So, Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Tamayo. I'm an enrolled member of the Rosewood Sioux Tribe. In my language, we identify my tribal nation as the Sichangu Lakota. My family comes from a small community called Milk's Camp. And so I am currently the specialist for Omaha Public Schools. I'm also adjunct instructor for Metropolitan Community College. And I am one of the founders of the Fort Omaha Intertribal Celebration Powwow. And so many, many moons ago, I was asked to attend a meeting with this very well-respected elderly grandpa by the name of Howard Wolf. And so Howard's the one that brought me to the meeting um, initially some 32 years ago. And so with that understanding, I've been able to build a, an amazing relationship with not only the staff, but Barbara Velasquez, who has been the coordinator for the intertribal celebration once again for decades. And so my discussion today is about traditional attire. And traditional attire for me is I'm going to be explaining our buckskin dresses of the Plains region specific, not Lakota specific. And so understanding that, I'm going to explain our patterns and how they were created. And so long ago, we would utilize the buffalo hides. We would utilize the, the elk and the deer and the antelope. And what made the difference was actually the climate. What was the temperature? What season was it? And so in the winter time, we would bust out our buffalo robes use the hides for our dresses, make our leggings, our moccasins, you name it. And so one thing about our hides is to waterproof our hides is to smoke the hides. When we smoke the hides, we would actually create like a tripod and wrap that hide around the outside of that tripod. And then we would use old rotten wood because all we wanted was smoke. We, we didn't want the heat. We didn't want flames. And so what the smoke did was it created its own um, protector, one might say. And so what it did was it was actually closing, closing up the collagen fibers, making them more compact. And so when they became hardened and more compact, it would actually waterproof the hide. And those, were, those hides were ideal for our moccasins, our leggings, our raincoats, you name it. And so that's the big difference there. So when we tan our hides, we remove the meat, the fat, the epidermis, the membrane, all on the flesh side. We're stretching that hide to the max. Back in the day, our grandmas would utilize choke cherry sticks and use a bone awl to puncture into the hide, to stretch that hide, and then to hammer it down with mallets or elk antlers. And so we would once again, scrape all the meat, the fat, the epidermis, the membrane, open up the collagen fibers. Once we scrape that hide clean, we would open those fibers up once again. And this is when we applied the brain fat and water solution. Because of the acids, the enzymes inside of that brain fat water solution, this is what helped break down the hide. And so once we had these hides, once again, we would have buffalo in the wintertime. In the fall time, it was 
it was common for us to utilize the elk. In the summertime, quite often we would utilize all of our deer hides. And when it was nice and hot in the summer, summer, we would utilize our antelope hides. And so this is the variance. This is why would you, we would utilize these different thicknesses of the hide because of the temperature and the climate. And so once we had these hides laid out, we would actually measure the individual from the, from, um, the length, from the top to the midsection to the waist. And so we would get all these measurements by string, by rope, by lace, because long ago we didn't have any tape measures. So that's important about that. And so what we would do is we would lay out a hide, we would get these measurements, we would make a pattern. And so a pattern for one of the oldest styles of dresses that has been in existence on the plains is actually the side fold. The side fold was around for hundreds and hundreds of years. It actually disappeared in the early part of the 1800s because by then there was a new relative on the plains. And because of the restrictions with the side fold dress, it was kind of difficult to actually jump on the horse. And so this is a side fold pattern. So once again, we would get the measurements of the top of the midsection of the waist and the length and our pattern would look very similar to this. This part on the top would fold down and it would wrap around. And so right here is the proper right. This allowed the arm to come through. And so on the proper left is where the legs would hang down. This is where we would sew. And so every time in any time we would sew any of our pieces of uh, clothing, all of our stitches were always on the inside, never on the outside. And so it would kind of be puckered into each other. And then in between, we would have another lace, thick lace, which helped strengthen that stitch right there. And so this is the side fold dress. And so this is a very old style dress. And so today there's only 13 known dresses to exist in the world. And so this is the rarity of this dress. And so in this uh, presentation, hopefully we'll be able to share one of my photos of a dress that was collected in 1804 by Lewis and Clark. It was a side fold dress that was collected once again at Fort Pier way back in the day. And so what they did with that dress is when they headed back to the East Coast, they gifted that dress to Dolly Madison. And Dolly Madison, in turn, returned it to a museum at Harvard. And so there is a museum called the Peabody. And that's where that, mu that's where that dress has been housed for centuries. And so that's how important that dress is, the historical significance of that. So once again, the first dress I wanted to explain is the side fold. And for adornment purposes, we would have coinage. We would have brass tacks. We would have beads that were brought here from Europe. And so long ago, the beads that we utilized were much bigger than the seed beads that you know of today. Those beads are what we call ponies, pony beads, because they were actually brought on the backs of the pony horses. And this is why we just identified that type of bead as a pony bead. And so we would have very simple rows of colors of white and blue. This was the common beads used back in the day because of availability, but also because of the importance and significance of these two colors. That blue representing the sky, but also that blue representing the water. Because for us as indigenous people, we have always been the environmental protectors of the waters. Because to us, this is life. In the Lakota language, we say, Mini we choni, or mini we choni we chosen. And so living and understanding the importance as the protectors of the water, this is how important this is that we've passed it on for many generations to come. And so once again, the first dress I want to explain is 
the side fold, and that's what this dress is. The second dress is very simple because once again, for the Lakotas, when we captured the horse, it wasn't until 1709 because of what they call the Pueblo Revolt that occurred in 1680. And so down at the Black Mesa, this is when the Pueblo people were actually able to push back the Spaniards. For 12 years, they, they held them back. And within those, that 12 year span, they released the horse to North America. And so for the Lakotas, according to our own winter counts, winter counts are painted buffalo robes with little icons incorporated into, into the design of this robe that, that spiraled outward, but it actually told the history of the people because we didn't have a written language, but our written language was, was created by the symbology or the, the icons that we incorporated into the buffalo hide to tell our own story. And so in there, if you count back from this historical event that occurred in 1803, 1804, this is the most significant event that occurred on the plains during that time period. We call it when the stars fell. It was a huge meteorite shower. And so all of the winter counts that existed in the plains, this is the most significant event that occurred on, that was painted and documented on our buffalo robes on at least 95% of them. And so the significance of that meteorite shower is a way for us to tell back time by counting the little icons. And so in one of, little, one of the buffalo robes, once again, in 1709, 1710, this is when we captured the Dakota people, captured the first horse from the Umaha people who had the, the horse in their possession years prior to that. And so once again, when that horse made its way to the plains because of how wide it is, our dresses had to change because of the constraints of how narrow this is. So we made the bottom of our dresses more wider. And so when you look at fashion, when you look at design, understand the importance of the A shape pattern. And so I will get into another pattern that we will discuss after this. And so this is what we call the two hide dress. This is one big piece of elk or buffalo. So once again, according to the measurements of the shoulder, of the length, of the top, of the waist, and down below, what I did with this pattern was I actually tapered it. And I wanted to taper it outward to represent the legs of the four-legged relative. And so some of our dresses have what they call a gusset. But in this dress, it was common just to have one hide and then another hide, the same measurements put together once again, we would sew our dresses on the inside and then turn them right side out. And so understanding that the, the way for us to adorn this dress was, it was common for our young men to start hunting the elk. And when they hunted the elk, his female relatives would extract the two molars off of that elk. And so there are the two teeth of each elk. And so they would house, they would collect, they would um, hold on to all these teeth, these ivory elk teeth. And so when that young man was, was ready to marry, ready to join another family, his family would decorate and adorn this new dress for the new bride. Because what they were doing was they were showing that next village what kind of provider they were about to uh, have in their possession. And so this is the importance of our elk teeth on our dresses. And so these are stories that we need to pass on to that next generation to understand the importance of our capabilities as natural hunters of the lands way back in the day. And so not only did we utilize the beads from Europe, but we also utilized the elk teeth of the Plains region. And so once again, this is the two-hide dress. And so one thing about our two-hide dresses is 
on the top part underneath the chin on the neckline, we would always leave that tail that was attached to, to this deer or to this elk. We would sew that tail into the front. And then the same with the back because we were using two hides, two skins. So we would utilize both tails and then sew the other tail on the opposite side. And so once again, we wanted that four-legged relative to be whole. And that's why we did things like that. And so here comes beads once again. And so if that tail was right here, when the glass beads, the pony beads, when they made their ways here, we started to incorporate them for decoration and adornment on our dresses. And so our beadwork would flow on the natural curvature of that dress and go around that tail, then come back up and go back down the other side of the arm. And so that was our first row in. And then we would just keep going and going until we filled up the top of that dress. And so this is the two hide. So once again, I explained the side fold. Now we have the two hide. The last dress I wanted to explain with my little patterns is the, the three hide dress. So the three hide dress is a combination, not only of the A-shaped pattern, but also the T pattern. The T pattern comes into play here. And so if you open this up, this looks very similar to a poncho. So the head would slide into here. And so this would drape over the shoulders. And so once again, the measurement for this is it's shoulder to shoulder, but what else is the measurement from the shoulder all the way down to the wrist of the individual. And that will determine how long the sleeve has to be. So now we have this top part. And so this is the three height address. So we would have one piece here, another piece for the front. And on here, we have this little tab extending down and we would sew this into that piece. And so there is two hides. So when you turned it around, we would have another hide. And this is why we call this the three hide dress. And so we would have all three pieces sewn together flat like this. And so we would also add two gussets on the side. The gussets on the side were from four to eight inches wide on each side, but they were tapered. They were kind of narrow up at the top and they would extend down and sewn into both sides of the dress. And so this allowed our women to sit down very comfortably because we didn't have chairs. You have to be mindful of our clothing back in the day that we never had chairs to sit down in. And so we would sit directly on the floor. And so right behind us, we would have a little tripod. And so in the front two, we would have two poles extending down and the main support would be in the back and that stabilized that. And then what we would do was we would get willow branches and make a backrest and sew them all together and then loop it over that back middle pole for that tripod and those willow branches just extended downward. And so when we sat on the floor, we could just sit back and those willow branches was our back support. And so our young ladies would just sit down and just start sewing and visiting and creating with that being nice and comfortable for them. Because once again, we didn't have tables, we didn't have chairs. And so this is how important our backrests were, just to make it comfortable to complete the task that needed to be done. And so once again, we started to bead the borders. We started to incorporate designs. But now what happened is, is we would incorporate the beadwork here because we removed the tail. And so now we have this whole entire poncho and so today we bead the whole entire poncho still today. And so the value of these dresses today are about $20,000 because it takes at least two years to complete the task of creating this dress. And usually it's always done by more than one individual. 
And so you have to compensate, you have to take care of our crafters for their skill set. And so from 20 to $100,000, because this is just the dress. What about all the adornments? What about all the headpieces, the earrings, the necklaces, the beaded purse? And so one thing about this is, you know, this is just the dress once again, because all of our ladies way back in the day, they had a belt that we call a utility belt. It was made out of latigo. Latigo comes from the deer hide. Prior to that, we utilized raw hide from our buffalo and our elk. And so we would get that raw hide, we would flatten it out, we would soak it so it's nice and soft and pliable. We would get our obsidian rock and then cut and make a nice belt strip. And so for the Lakotas, we have an extra side drop always on the proper right that would extend down. But what this belt is, is I once again said that it was a utility belt because in the back, if this lady was right-handed or left-handed, this is where she would wear her knife sheath. So if she was right-handed, it'd always be in the right. So she had access to it very quickly. In the middle, we would have a flat case. And so this is, if this was a piece of rawhide, here is a flat case. I would fold this up and I would fold this piece down. I would put holes on both sides and this became a rawhide container. And so this container is known as a strike -a light bag. Inside is how we were able to start our fires with our flint, with our steel, with our kindling, whatever we wanted to utilize to start that fire in the beginning. And then on the opposite side of the knife sheath, we always had an awl case. An awl is a tool that we utilized once again to puncture our hides before needles were brought here from Europe. Because indigenous people never utilized metal. We never had metal. The only metal that existed way back in the day was copper which is a soft metal, we never used it for sewing. And so understanding that what we did was we would get the bones of the young deer and we would smash those leg bones. We would get splinters of the bone and we would sand it and grind it down onto a harder rock, giving it a nice point. And so this was a puncture tool that we would utilize to puncture into the hides that, so that we were able to sew our dresses and our moccasins and our teepees, but this is the process. And so back in the day, our thread was actually the tendons. It was the muscle fiber. And so understanding the importance of that muscle fiber from the back of that buffalo all the way to the tail, that sinew, that tendon, that muscle fiber was almost six feet in length. And so what we would do, what we would do after that is one end, we would tie it up. We would tie that up into the tree. The other end, we would tie it to a rock, something heavy. And then we would start to stretch that muscle fiber. And once it starts to dry out, we would take it down every now and then and just smash it out. And we would flatten that sinew. And so once it dried and hardened, this is how we were able to store and just carry it and put it into our rawhide containers, which is our boxes. And so our rawhide container for sewing kits would have the muscle fiber, the sinew, but it would also have all of these um, shards of the bone, which were our needles. And so we would have different thicknesses because sometimes we were beading, sometimes we were sewing. So depending on the task that needed to be completed would determine what type and how big of an awl are you going to be utilizing. And we would always have rocks in there, always to sharpen them up because we would dull the, bo or the bone itself from puncturing into the hides. And so this is one thing about the importance of our clothing of the plains, from our side fold to our, our two hide to our three hide, but things changed up. And so in the 1850s, the United States government brought us these trade cloth wool blankets. And so one thing about the trade cloth blankets is the ones that arrived into this region of 
um, Nebraska, South Dakota, most of them were blue. And so we know the sheep to be white. And so what they would do is once they made that blanket in Europe, they had these clamps and some of them looked like sawtooth and they had teeth like this and they would clamp onto that wool blanket and they would dip it down into the dye and then bring it up and do that several times. And then when they brought it up, they would rinse it out to remove all the excess dye and then unclamp it. And that's what they call the selvage. When that material was brought to the East Coast, the ladies from Europe thought that that piece was that side of that blanket, the edges were all ugly and it was unfinished. And so they would require them to cut that off. But when the traders found out that if they brought that material to the plains, the indigenous people, the indigenous women loved that because those triangular shapes of the solid two clamp actually look like our teepees. And so that was an added design element incorporated onto the selvage into the ends of our dresses. And so that's how important the selvage is to the indigenous people. And so you will see our dresses of yesteryear and even today with the selvage intact. And so once again, you know, there was another trade item that made its way here. And those are called dentelium shells. And so for the Lakotas, when those dentelium shells made their way here, they're very long and really narrow at the top and then they widen. It looks like an elephant tusk, but small shells. And so what we did with the shells is we would adorn, we would make earrings, we would make necklaces, we would sew them into and onto that trade cloth material. And so it became a very hot trade item. And they said that way back in the day, a handful of dentelium shells was worth the value of a brain tan buffalo robe because those shells had to travel miles, thousands of miles to get here to the center of Turtle Island. And so that was the value of that trade item specific. And so we utilized it for adornment. We utilized it for decoration and sewed it directly onto that trade cloth material. And so if you look at our trade cloth dresses, you'll see some of the elk teeth and shells going across horizontal. Anytime you see dresses like that, the makers of that type of dress and the technique in which they incorporated were usually on the opposite side of the Rocky Hills or the Rocky Mountains. And so for the Lakotas, when we started to incorporate our elk teeth and shells in um, yokes of the dentelium shells, we did everything in the round because of the many circles that exist. And so you'll see the elk teeth that go around the neckline and then you come down an inch and then there's a second row, come down another inch, there's the third row, come down another inch and the fourth row. And so that's the differences because when you look at our dresses, you should be able to tell, to differentiate what tribal nation does that clothing come from. And so once again, I wanna thank Metropolitan Community College for continuing and understanding the importance of this cultural knowledge and to share it with whoever and however, um, ways and means that we can with the people. Hopefully we can be in person next year for our 32nd annual Fort Omaha Intertribal Celebration. And so until then, have an awesome day. Thank you very much. Okay. But we, we're on because it's female. It's yeah. feminine. Oh, <laughs> hi there. You caught me uh, off guard. We had a couple questions come in from the audience. One is explain the making of head roaches. And I'm going to turn that over to Mike. He brought his example to show. Hi, this is what we call porcupine hair roach. And it's actually made out of both porcupine hair and dyed deer tail. Um, you start out with a base that you can make either out of a rope base or a, a, a woven yarn base are the two most common. In the old days, they used to take the brown deer tail that they didn't use 
for the dyed part. And they would tie that and tie it and tie it. And they would make the bases out of the, the actual deer tail. But nowadays to speed things up, we make bases out of material. Um, then to, to tie the, the porcupine hair, what I do is I, I sort it first. Usually you get just bundles of hair of all different sizes. And I take it in a glass and I shake it up and down and then I sort it out by size. And I go down an inch at a time for long hair to the shorter hair. And so then when you're ready to tie, there's a, I make a wooden loom. It's just a piece of wood with two uprights. And in between that, you, you take a, your base string that your hair is going to be tied to. And you run that across. And I take a, a Sharpie and I figure out ahead of time on where I want the varying sizes of hair to go. Because they graduate from smallest up to the longest in front. I make a little chart so I know where the hair is going to be. And then I put marks on that string. So I know where to start the different sizes of hair. So then you just take the hair and you just bend about the bottom quarter inch of it over that guide string. And you take another string and you wrap it around and tie a knot through. And you just do that over and over and over. And then the same thing with the deer tail. Um, this is dyed uh, white tail deer hair. And you, you cut it off the tail and you tie it in the same way. And then when you're all done, you take that hair and you sew it to your base. And then when, usually when you're done with that piece, it looks like a mess. It, the hair's everywhere, right? So what you do is you, I wet it down with hot water, not real hot, but just warm water. And we have a stick that we put this on to when we're not wearing it. And you put it on the stick and then I take an ace bandage and I wrap it up and let it dry. And then just repeat that over and over again. And eventually you get this nice shape with the hair all together. But that's how it's made. It's, it's once again, one of those time consuming things where you just sit and you tie hair for hours and hours and hours. So, and uh, nowadays this is real porcupine hair which is getting harder and harder to get. And it's very expensive. So there's a imitation hair. It's actually plastic hair that looks like real porcupine hair. And it's a little harder to work with, but it's a whole lot cheaper. Instead of $60 an ounce, you're talking $6 an ounce for the imitation hair. And they, they look pretty good. They, they tend to really, really flop. Uh, a lot of dancers like that these days. So you can, and that's probably for a beginner, that's probably the way to go is to try one with the imitation hair first. Uh, like I said, it's a little harder to tie. You got to really bend it over and kind of form it with your fingers as you're tying your knots. But uh, that's how it's done. How many ounces does it take? Um, well, depending on the size, uh, this is a 19 inch and there's probably three ounces of hair in that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the deer tail, probably four to five tails. Uh, this roach have got hair on both the outside and the inside. You don't have to do the inside. Uh, a lot of people just leave that plain and then tie the, the colored hair to the outside. And you can do all kinds of different designs with the deer tail. Um, can have it a solid color. Uh, some people will have like red and then break off to like a rainbow set of colors and then back to red or white with a rainbow. And you can do different designs. This was popular for a while where we're actually doing different colors and kind of shaping it by, do, by layering it. And once again, it's kind of quite a bit of work. I, I took me about three tries to get it right. First couple I did, I, I tied them and then I cut them on the string. And then when I cut the, the main string, it just kind of shriveled up on me. <laughs> so I, I learned to go ahead and uh, tie it and get it all ready and then cut it. So 
There she is, you porcupine hair roach. Okay, all you guys get started. It's gonna <laughs> take you a couple of days. You know, one thing I'd like to add is, you know, because it's hair, it's hair fiber. And so one thing about hair fiber, just like our hair, you know, this is why we use conditioner. And so, you know, once a year, every other year, I get a, a baby oil and some water mixture and I just saturate it and I let it set for a month or two and it just absorbs that, that conditions the it. conditions. Yeah. And so it kind of revives it, you know, because of the sun, you know, the rain, the heat, um, the mm -hmm. cold, it just dries out that fiber. And so if you look at and see old museum pieces or, you know, old head roaches of dancers, um, they just didn't do that. And it's hair fiber, it is going to break, you know, so just be mindful of that. And mm -hmm. you have to really learn how to take care of, you know, not only that hair, but um, our feathers and the barbs that are binding that that feather together. And so quite often, I do the same thing with my with my bustles, is because, you know, they just dry out. And once they dry out, they become brittle. So, you know, it's just understanding the, the material item and, and preserving it the best way possible. So Steve, do contemporary powwow dresses resemble the patterns that you have described? You know, in my talk, you know, I started off with a really old style uh, side fold. And once again, you know, um, in the museum world, there's only 13 side fold dresses left in existence. And so it is, um, there are people from around the country that are trying to replicate that old dance style, but you don't very, you don't see that very often. And so from that too hide, you know, it's more naturalistic. If you look at, um, if you Google these, you know, look at a two hide and you'll see how the fringe is just hanging down. And, and a lot of times the maker back in the day left the, the, the claws on, they would leave just the hair follicles, all kinds of stuff because it's just natural fiber. And so um, because of European influence, once again, we started to alter, we started to trim up and, and cut up our, our hides, you know? And so when you look at our three hide dress today, you know, that's been altered, it's trimmed, you know? And it's, it's a clean cut going across, you know, and, and the, the sleeves. Sometimes the sleeves are straight across, sometimes they're scalloped like this, sometimes they're zigzag. And so once again, depending on what tribal nation, what tribal affiliation that, that young lady is, um, will make the difference of what type and, and style of cuts are you incorporating into that. And so one thing about our fringe is, um, one thing I didn't add was, you know, we would soak that, that fringe and then twist it because once again, the fringe served that specific purpose of drainage for our hides. And so when the moisture worked its way down because of gravity, it would hit the fringe and then spiral down that. And so that's the purpose and function that we have for our fringe first and foremost. And so, you know, once again, this old style is, is why, you know, I, it's so important to research. And so I make patterns for everything, just like Mike, we make patterns out of cloth or whatever, first and foremost, because you get one cut on that hide and it has to be on. And so you have to make sure that those measurements are exact what you need. <clears throat> and so, you know, doing this research, I try to find um, just the most knowledgeable people out there. And so for us, you know, we're, we're called these uh, cultural bearers, cultural specialists. Mm -hmm. And so they're the keepers of the culture. And so there's a, a, a young lady on my reservation by the name of Denise One Star, who is amazing. And so I've been visiting with her for, you know, 20 plus years. And I'm still asking her questions about this and that. And so she's always helping me because she knows that, you know, collectively, you know, coming together, we can uh, strengthen our own communities. And that's the, you know, that's the most important thing. And so there's a family called the Growing Thunder family. And so they're uh, a Cinnaboyne, which means that they are part of the, the Siouan tribal nation. And so I'm a Lakota and we also have Dakotas, but the Assiniboine and Stony people, they're actually Nakota speakers. And so they are relatives linguistically. They just took off up to, to Canada and they never came back home. And so 
if you want to do research on on some amazing ladies, look up Joyce, look up Juanita, look up uh, Jessa Ray, Growing Thunder, because their work is in every major museum in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there is an, a museum, there's a, a, an exhibit coming to Omaha by the Jocelyn Museum, and it is going to be amazing. And so I, I am so looking forward to that. But Jessa Ray is, is just amazing by herself. You know, she's, she's mid thirties. She's just amazing master's degree, but she is probably one of the finest beaters and quill workers I've ever come across. And so understanding that, you know, that gives me that, that goal, that next goal, you know, I got to go up there, but I'm always asking them all kinds of questions and they're very open and friendly with their knowledge. And, and that's what I love about that family. And so, <clears throat> With the contemporary twist today, we're still utilizing our old techniques and, and styles of cuts, but now we have material items created by designers in the contemporary world. And that's where Lauren Goodday and, and Bethany Yellowtail. And so this is the material items that a lot of our young ladies are wearing today because they are following these designs of these indigenous, amazing women who are um, creating their own fashion design. And so with that, this is the material in which we're making our skirts and our dresses. And so if you are a designer of this indigenous way of being, then you should submit your drawings to Teton Cloth Fabrics because they are the ones that are printing all of these designs from all of these fashion designers. And so if they do utilize your designs, they will print your name in that material. Mm -hmm. And so if you do buy the material, and the reason why I'm telling you this, because if you buy the material from Lauren Goodday and Bethany Yellowtail and anybody else who submitted their um, designs to the Teton cloth fabric, look in the back on the bottom in that white selvage and the name of the designer is in, it's in there. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's amazing about that. So don't cut that off because you're identifying that specific indigenous person for their talents and their cultural expertise and knowledge. So thanks for the questions. Good one, anything else? Um, Barbara, what's that? Uh, we don't have any more questions that have come in. You might, we might round it out with one final question that um, you would like to ask everybody, Carolyn, and then um, we'll close down. We move. Yeah. Good move. Oh, we yeah. um, move. Go ahead. Yeah. What'd you say? Go with these. Oh, could okay. You, could you hear me, Carolyn? They want to know how do you question. improve your skills. I think you heard uh, Steve just say you got to talk to the people who are doing these things and research and and study and be willing to contribute all that they they want to know where you get the materials for your projects well all over the place uh, <laughs> uh in the past I, some of my porcupine hair i've actually gotten from steve who got it from people he knows up on rosebud um you <laughs> can got it believe it or not porcupine. you can get it on ebay um there's a lot of different trading posts around like super Nas, Crazy Crow, um, Walk a Day. Am I missing anybody? Knock, Knock Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go online and search under uh, craft materials, there's a lot out there. Uh, my mm -hmm. beads, I actually go to the source. Uh, there's a place in New York called Harmon Beads that is actually a distributor to all these other places. And you have to buy bulk, but I get a lot of my bead from them. There's shipwreck beads is a good one. That's an online place. Um, if you go to a powwow, there's usually a vendor selling beads. Mm -hmm. um, uh, hackles I get from a place called Swartz and Sons, which is actually in New York also. They actually do the dyeing, uh, but you have to buy in bulk. Uh, Super Dodge is a good place for hackles. Um, Crazy Crow's got a lot of different things like the, you see the, the fringe on my outfits, uh, that's called flat fringe. And the only place I've ever found that was at Crazy Crow. 
which is out of Texas. Um, uh, turkey feathers I get from friends that go hunting. Um, and then, uh, you know, actually eagle feathers you have to get through the depository. Through the depository in Denver, you have to apply for them and have a permit to even have them. So, but uh, that's pretty much, I mean, all over the place. Uh, there's so much online these days, it's, it's amazing what you can find out there. Anything to add? You know, I harvest my materials from just the natural world. And so on my reservation, um, we feed a lot of our college students buffalo meat because that's the only meat we have access to. And so this is where I receive all of my uh, hides and skulls and bones. And so, but, you know, I also harvest my own um, buffalo horn. And so this is my drinking cup. And so understanding that, you know, um, this is porcupine quills, this is quill work, this is called uh, a wrap. And so it's tucked up underneath each one and each one of these is just a strip of rawhide. And then collectively it's all one piece. And then mm -hmm. we just incorporate it in there after we do the wraps. And so, but just be in one piece, you know, um, this is my water cup, but it is the buffalo horn cap with the porcupine quills. And so once again, you know, as a traditional artist, I'm just trying to maintain this old style of the traditional uh, art form of the Plains people specific. And so, um, you know, there's bead stores everywhere. There's, there's everything you need is online, but also everything you need is outside. Uh -huh. And so a lot of my art is just bones, it's rocks, it's feathers, it's sticks, it's hides. And so my own paint, my own vegetable dyes, everything is outside. And so I think this is where we need to focus on is more of this naturalistic world because of, of how natural all of this is. And so I love head roaches. I've learned how to make head roaches just like Mike. And so understanding that, you know, I knew that it was three ounces of hair that we utilized in there. And so um, it's a task. And yeah. Mike and I are the only head roach makers in Omaha. And we want to increase uh -oh. that, serious. The secret's out now. <laughs> serious, we want to increase those numbers because I would love to show somebody how to do this, but it just takes the time and the patience once again. And so there's a lot of people that are beating because of that pandemic, because it, it became a pastime. And so understanding that, you know, a lot of people got into these trinkets of bracelets and keychains, but think about something like this. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. And so the time, the commitment, the perseverance, think about the design concepts, what is the symbology? There are specific numbers that we incorporate. For Umahas, you know, we identify, of course, four as all indigenous people. Mm -hmm. But Umaha people also have the five sky and five earth clans. Yep. And so 10 plays out just like our Ho-Chunk relatives because of the 12 clans. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that we identify the 13 moons, the 28 days in between the moons. And so this is numerology. And so once again, because of our research, this is how important the recreation of this indigenous way of life is and how it is. And so, you know, I call Mike my brother all the time because we have a ceremony of gathering kinship. And to us, it's not about our skin color. It's about this way of life specific. And so Mike has been living this way for 40, 50 years. I don't even know how old this guy is. He's been dancing this way forever. And so I'm just really proud to call him my brother and to see him here on the TV screen. Oh. is is a blessing within itself you know and sitting here with big mama as the moderator you know oh. and thank you all yeah and uh they want to know about the spirituality and the little i know because i'm not an artist at all is that whenever i do create anything or so i always have good prayers and good thinking in everything that we do because 
you know, if it's not us, it's our children or our relatives going to be wearing and using this. And you want those good prayers and good thoughts to be into that, that, uh, that creation. So, and I know you guys do that all the time too. Yeah, there's a, like you say, when, when you work with feathers, I, I always pray. I thank that bird for giving mm -hmm. that to me for something that I can use and I can wear. And I remember that bird. And when I do beadwork, they say, if you make a little mistake, leave that mistake. That, that way you're showing the creator that you are imperfect. He's the only perfect being. And that little imperfection is, is there to remind you of that. So when you're working, and I and I a lot of times coming up with designs, I come up through a prayer mm -hmm. or a dream. It's amazing how many times I have actually dreamed a whole outfit and and turn it into what I wear. So there's always that you have to remember there's something above you that's giving you the the skill and the idea to to create this and you have to remember that as you work and remember that all those who came before too i uh, i heard a guy one time say you know our ancestors are before us and i thought that doesn't make any sense they're in front of us no they came before us so we're walking on on our ancestors dreams and prayers and my uh, museum up at Winnebago has a saying on back of one of their museum shirts that says, you are the prayers that the ancestors made. You're the answer to the prayers the ancestors made. And I like to see that on the kids, you know, and tell them that. And they're, uh, they sometimes forget about that part. So anyway, just want to take this opportunity to thank Metro, Barb, Nate, Teresa. Thank I almost you. forgot your name. <laughs> My brother, Steve, my little chunchke over here, Mike. I've watched him dance since he was about as big as one of these little bustles here. <laughs> so anyway, and thank you people out there for supporting the Metro Virtual Powwow. Once again this year, let's, let's get together again. Have a good night. Me talk ya, say good night. All right, everybody. See you tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, 10.30. Can you hear me? 10 30 in the morning tomorrow and fill out that evaluation the link is in your chat that will be your opportunity to be entered into a free drawing for this dark quilt that we were told about um, earlier by alex Loverin. tomorrow morning 10 30 new breed our host southern drum with OC Earth, the lead singer. This will be a shorter program. It's actually gonna be about a half an hour, 10, uh, 10.30 to 11. Look forward to seeing you in the morning. Goodbye, everybody.